Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, everyone, excuse me. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Harmony Barker. I am the Public Programs Manager at Holocaust Museum LA, the first Holocaust Museum in the United States founded by survivors. We were founded in 1961 by survivors who wanted to create a safe place to display their precious artifacts in perpetuity and to remember their family members and loved ones who had perished. Today, the museum continues to provide free Holocaust education to students from across Los Angeles, the United States and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founding survivors to commemorate, educate, and inspire. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Intergenerational Trauma in Second and Third Generation Holocaust Survivors, with a dis for a discussion with Dr. Melissa Wasserman, moderated by Lisa Ansel. We are honored to have them both here with us today. Dr. Melissa Wasserman is a clinical psychologist and adjunct professor of psychology at Pepperdine University's Graduate School of Education and Psychology. She specializes in post-traumatic stress disorder, military behavioral health, couple and family psychology, and corporate health and wellness. Dr. Wasserman received her doctorate at Pepperdine University and completed her pre-doctoral internship at UCLA Semmel Institute Stress, Trauma, and Resilience Track. She completed a formal two-year postdoctoral fellowship at UCLA's Nathanson Family Resilience Center, in which she was a trauma therapist to individuals, couples, and families who have experienced trauma-related stressors and challenges. She is also the founder of Malila Integrative Health. Lisa Ansel is the assistant director of the USC Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. Lisa received her BA in French and Near East Studies from UCLA, her master's in Middle East Studies from Harvard, and was the founding chair of the World Language Department of the Toledo High School. Lisa has served as an official translator for the Consulate General of Israel in Los Angeles, and Lisa currently teaches Hebrew language at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. She is also a frequent contributor to the Jewish Journal and to the Jerusalem Post. Uh, before I turn it over to Lisa and Melissa to start our conversation, I uh, just want to remind everyone that we will have some time at the end of the program for questions. You will be able to ask a question by typing it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Wasserman and Lisa Ansel. Thank you so much, Harmony, for the introduction. And on behalf of the USC Kasdan Institute, I wish to thank the Holocaust Museum LA for inviting me to engage the topic of intergenerational trauma with Dr. Wasserman. It is indeed an honor to be here today and participate in this most important discussion with you. To begin today's conversation, I thought that it would be beneficial to have a clear definition of what intergenerational trauma is and your work as a clinical psychologist and professor and how this focuses on the specific type of trauma in your professional career. Thank you, Lisa. I'm, I'm happy to be here and, and just learn that you're a fellow Bruin too. So another thing that we have in common. So to define intergenerational trauma, there's a, there's a few terms that are fairly nuanced but similar in how they're talked about uh, in research and uh, in clinical work. And that includes intergenerational trauma, uh, secondary traumatization, vicarious trauma, collective trauma, cultural trauma, historical trauma. And while some of these are fairly nuanced, the terms really address the broad idea that the adverse consequences of traumatic experiences are not limited to the individuals who are directly exposed to the trauma, traumas, uh, or traumatic event. And so that the effects can impact others in the environment. So whether that be maybe family members, um, maybe children, descendants, um, uh, maybe their friends or caregivers, uh, individuals from the same cultural group. So this idea that the consequences and resilience, these which we'll talk a little bit about, um, of trauma are not just limited to those who were directly exposed. And in fact, there has been a lot of recent, recent research on this uh, idea of indirectly experiencing a trauma can actually have very similar effects to those who have been directly 
uh, exposed to the traumatic event. So again, all of those terms kind of broadly address that idea that we don't necessarily need direct exposure to a trauma, traumatic event, or even events to experience the uh, challenges and consequences um, uh, of that trauma. Indeed, and that would be a great point to segue into our next question. And that is, could you discuss briefly the theory of epigenetics and the idea of how one's environment can affect genetic expression within second and third generation Holocaust survivors? Sure. So in 2016, there was uh, work that was uh, conducted uh, by Yehuda and colleagues. And the, the research on this um, is fairly a mixed bag, but that study in particular found that bo uh, both Holocaust survivors and their offspring have methylation changes um, in the FKBP gene. And that gene has been identified as having a role in PTSD, in stress, in depression, um, in anxiety. And that uh, stress-related gene has been associated with some of those difficulties, right? PTSD, depression, anxiety. And so researchers examined blood samples of 32 Holocaust survivors and 22 of their adult uh, children. And so uh, they compared it to a control group of the methylation of this specific uh, of this specific gene, and so that study concluded and suggests that Holocaust trauma may shift the biology um, of descendants. And so the observations of that change in both parent and child, so the Holocaust survivor and their adult child, um, suggests that the children of traumatized uh, parents. Uh, you know, are not, uh, may be born with this sort of methylation change, the genetic change. Um, and so they may inherit traits uh, that, that might um, make them a little bit more susceptible, but also, again, speaking to that resiliency point, um, you know, wanting to make space for both the potential vulnerabilities of those experiences and being a descendant of um, a survivor of genocide or, or a Holocaust um, survivor, but also wanting to make space. And in the conclusions of this study, they also talk about wanting to make space and of the, for the resilience. And so the post-traumatic growth, the strength-based pieces um, as well. And so oftentimes when we're talking about this idea of intergenerational trauma, um, you know, we can hold space for the challenges and the consequences, but also holding space for possibly the post-traumatic growth and the resiliencies that might emerge out of that. That, that's a fascinating point. And to that note, I would ask you, how does intergenerational trauma affect familial relationships? And how can people dealing with intergenerational trauma, especially people who are raising or thinking about raising the next generation, be proactive about minimizing intergenerational trauma for their own children? And that's such a great question. And, and particularly be a familial relationships piece is such a key part of the research and has been studied in uh, not just uh, Holocaust survivors, has been studied in a variety of different uh, groups and populations um, and cultural groups that have experienced this historical intergenerational trauma that we've been talking about. And so that um, familial relationships piece is what prompted me in my experiences uh, being the grandchild of a Holocaust survivor prompted me to really want to focus on that variable in my research. And so I looked specifically at family factors. So I looked at uh, family communication, I looked at family functioning, and how that relates to the expression of psychological symptoms in second and third generation Holocaust survivors. And so within my research, I found that descendants who reported less adaptive family communication or less adaptive emotional expression within their family actually endorsed higher levels of symptoms. And most specifically, symptoms of withdrawal and isolation. And so uh, we also found similarly that, that uh, descendants who were reporting less family cohesion, so feeling uh, less cohesive within their family unit um, and lower family levels of family functioning also reported significantly more symptoms related to anxiety and withdrawal and isolation. So what we wanna take away from that is, so what can we do to speak to your question? 
um, you know, what can we do uh, within the family unit, boosting and bolstering family resilience factors uh, as, as a, to, to promote family level resilience. And so when we talk about what is adaptive family functioning, healthy family functioning, um, when we talk, when we're talking about those terms, we're speaking most directly to communicating emotions, maybe feeling heard um, by our family members when we're talking about, when we're expressing emotions. Oftentimes it can be useful to have a shared emotional language within the family, um, you know, speaking about emotions freely in helpful and useful ways, right? Um, using non-blaming language, um, you know, using things that we talk about in pop psychology, like I statements and validating and making sure we all feel heard. Um, that also relates to ideas of family cohesion and family functioning. Um, you know, do, do as families, do we collaboratively problem solve? Do we feel accepted within the family unit for who we are? Do we trust and turn to one another um, to support each other in times of crisis? Do we openly discuss our fears and concerns as a family unit? Those are all what we call family resilience factors. And so what the research, not just my research with Holocaust survivors, but family resiliency research uh, with other populations as well, shows that family resilience factors are huge and key. So we really need family level interventions to boost those skills and factors, um, more as a kind of preventative uh, pre prevention uh, model. And that can be a, a really useful piece, boosting those resiliency factors, communication, emotional expression, family cohesion, um, family problem solving, those are all things that we know are really useful and adaptive and helpful within the family context. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. That's so instructive. I'm also a grandchild of survivors and this gives me much wisdom as well. Uh, moving on to the next question, what are the layers of trauma that second and third generation survivors experience and do, does the intensity of those layers diminish with each subsequent generation? In other words, does intergenerational trauma always follow a linear path from first generation to second generation to third generation, or does it present differently in different family dynamics? You know, I think that's a, I wish there was an easy answer to that question. And, and mm -hmm. as I mentioned before in, the, in my research study, there was um, that relationship between family communication, family functioning, and psychological symptoms, anxiety, withdrawal, and isolation. That actually showed across the board in both second and third generation Holocaust survivors. There are also so many other variables that complicate research and complicate life, such as, you know, it, it would be, you know, maybe there would be an easy answer to that question if we lived in a vacuum, but we know that's not the case, right? And so there's so many environmental variables that we need to take into consideration that might not make it so linear, right? Um, and those are the things that we can't really ignore, those environmental factors, those environmental variables. So things like sociopolitical context, things like media exposure, social media exposure, um, those things can oftentimes be re-traumatizing and re-triggering in nature and complicate the context and the puzzle just a little bit. Other things, you know, seeing other groups being targeted and marginalized might also be uh, another re-traumatizer. The increase in hate crimes, the increase in, uh, in the rise of anti-Semitism, all of those things can act as sort of re-triggers uh, and re-traumatization. And so that, those are things that we can't really uh, ignore and might re-traumatize us in a way, and they've done a, a lot of research on uh, this fear of continued oppression. And if that's a part of cultural and intergenerational trauma, we can't really ignore the socio-political context and some of those, uh, those triggers and reminders um, that might kind of uh, prompt us and kind of connect us again with some of those really intense emotions that might come along with intergenerational trauma. Right, exactly. And thinking of the concept of fear of continued oppression, what are the channels available to express feelings of intergenerational trauma in positive and constructive ways? Yep. 
That's an excellent question. And I think that can look different for everyone. There's not necessarily a one size fits all, but you know, when we think about uh, things that support meaning making and connection are generally uh, for many positive ways, right? To connect with that. So perhaps maybe, um, you know, jo joining a support group of like-minded individuals or maybe individuals who have experienced and can connect with these constructives uh, of intergenerational trauma, collective and cultural trauma, perhaps more solitary ways of journaling, writing, um, reflection, expressive arts, um, activism, social justice. Uh, and, and in addition to that, when we think about meaning making in general, Right, research has shown the powerful effects of storytelling and narrative as a way that we can make meaning. Um, and Viktor Frankl has done a lot of work in his logotherapy about meaning making, narrative therapy. How do we make meaning out of trauma? And so, this the, the powerful effects of storytelling can be really, really um, important and can be a great way to connect with that in a constructive way, in a way that uh, make, we can make meaning in a more positive way. Um, and so those are just some examples of how we might be able to do that. Right, exactly. And when we think about uh, how we construct narrative and how we create meaning, what is the relationship between second and third generation survivors to visual and oral history of the Holocaust? Is there a heightened sense of moral obligation to preserve memory by the direct descendants of the Holocaust versus within the general population? Yeah, I, I think that, and this emerged in my qualitative interviews as well, and I know have emerged in other qualitative research around being the descendant of a Holocaust survivor. And I would argue maybe even as a Jew in, in general, this idea of never forget our duty to remember is something that's often explained in, in the relationship to the Holocaust and that the Jewish people must never forget and never let similar atrocities uh, occur, uh, occur again. And that's something that seems to reverberate um, across generations and may manifest in different ways. Um, you know, as, as you know, my personal experience, there has been this uh, I've taken on the role of family historian and taken it even a step further by conducting my dissertation on this as a means to make meaning for myself. And so, you know, I have so many books that talk about the experiences of the Holocaust and, and World War II, and, and I can speak to my father's experience as well, this almost borderline obsession with wanting to know more as much as we can, continue to um, think about these things uh, and so as, as we think about this idea and this notion of never forgetting, that might look totally different, right? Again, there's no one size fits all model for being a descendant or you know, being the child, grandchild, now great grandchild of, um, of Holocaust survivors. And so we likely connect to that, part, uh, to that part of our identity in a variety of different ways. And so a good place to start is to really ask yourself, how do I even connect with this part of my identity? How salient does this part of my identity uh, feel? And I mean, I'd love to ask that question to you, Lisa, of like, you know, how do, how do you connect with this part of your identity being um, the descendant of a survivor? That's a great question. To me, being a third generation survivor is something that I almost feel on a molecular level. It's part and parcel of the fabric of my being. And it really is what drives my sense of activism, my sense of responsibility, my, spent, my, my desire to preserve memory, not just for myself, but for subsequent generations. Um, I would say that as a grandchild of Holocaust survivors, the phrase a genocide denied is a genocide continued is particularly meaningful for me. And for this reason, uh, I would say President Biden's recent public recognition of the Armenian genocide particularly resonated with me as a moment of tremendous catharsis and kinship with descendants of the Armenian genocide. You know, it's, uh, 
being a descendant of a survivor is something that connects me to other descendants of other genocides and atrocities. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's a way that we, we can make meaning, right? Those connections, that feeling of connectedness can be so important and can even relate to our desires, our intentions to engage in advocacy efforts, to engage in social justice efforts. And that's a way that we, we make meaning as well. Um, and so, you know, a salient aspect for meaning making for some may be, you know, as a community member, as a group, feeling that sense of interconnectedness, um, you know, with humanity, with other groups who may have experienced similar things. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that, that that feeling of resonating with that and having that statement um, be important to you and feel connected to you, I, I imagine that you're not alone in that feeling. Exactly. And at this point, I would probably mention a project that both you and I participated in recently, a documentary project called If You Heard What I Heard. And would you like to um, explain a little bit about this project? Sure. So as a part of this project, um, both Lisa and I uh, were interviewed about our grandparents' experience and experiences uh, during the Holocaust. And so to speak to, again, that powerful component of storytelling and narrative, I'd love to ask you, Lisa, how you connected with it. But for me, it was extremely therapeutic and powerful to tell my grandmother's story. And to recount that felt so empowering. And to speak to all that she has been through, but to speak to also to the resiliencies um, that she passed down to my father and to me and to um, you know, my cousins uh, is something that I deeply resonate with. And so I'd love to even ask you, Lisa, too, like what was your experience to be able to tell and recount uh, your grandmother's narrative? You know, when I first embarked on this project, I was very apprehensive because my grandmother, who just passed several months ago, was very reserved about describing her experiences during the war. And so I would say as I grew older, when I started to approach her about her experience in the Holocaust, she started to open up to me very slowly, but it was definitely not a part of my childhood experience. We knew that she was a survivor. We knew that she was the sole survivor of her entire family. But as I grew older, I started to become much more inquisitive and I would say connected to my grandmother's past in a very powerful way. And giving this interview for me was an important opportunity to really reflect on the span of my grandmother's lifetime from her early childhood before the war to her Holocaust years in Auschwitz and after the war, subsequently her move to the United States. Um, it, was very empowering because it gave me a sense of how incredibly resilient she was to have lost her entire family at age 13 and to be faced with navigating an entire world by herself and then ultimately moving to a different country, learning a new language, learning a new trade, all on her own with my grandfather it's something that almost puts into perspective what we consider to be our challenges in our lifetime. Yeah, and, and that's something that you, know, you mentioned that sometimes survivors may not have openly shared their experiences. And what we know from the research and Daniele speaks of the, the conspiracy of silence with second generation survivors. First, the, the, the survivors themselves oftentimes didn't necessarily openly share their experiences with their children. And we can, you know, uh, we can assume maybe what some of those reasons might be. Maybe it was too soon. Maybe, um, you know, there was some compartmentalizing of this new life. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe it felt like too close of a relationship, didn't want to sort of share those experiences with their, their children. And so that was, 
communicated silence. But then the second generation didn't necessarily want to inquire to their parents' experience for fear of re-traumatizing them. So we have with the second generation, what was sometimes seen as this cycle of silence, right? First generation didn't share their experiences with their children, children for fear of re-traumatizing didn't inquire. Now that conspiracy of silence does not seem to translate to third generation survivors. And we see a different relationship with the trauma, with Holocaust trauma, with being a descendant of survivors with the third generation. And so what research does show is there's a different type of identification that third generation survivors have with their grandparents' uh, experience. And so oftentimes, and this showed up in my qualitative research as well, third generation openly inquired to their grandparents about their experiences. And survivors oftentimes share that willingly and openly with the third generation. And so what do we make of that, right? Maybe it was an amount of time that lapsed. Maybe there was a once removed generation that felt safer. Maybe, you know, we, we can sort of make assumptions and we don't know, right? We'll likely not know, but we can assume as to why there was that conspiracy of silence that often showed up with second generation survivors and how the line of communication seemed to open up a little bit more in a different way with third generation survivors. Absolutely, and to that point, I would say that when I was in my early 20s, I chose to learn Yiddish, my grandmother's native tongue, in Israel on a fellowship program. And when I came back to Los Angeles, being able to communicate with my grandmother in her native tongue added a whole other dimension to our relationship and for her ability to communicate with me, to communicate ideas and facets of her life that otherwise she may have lacked the vocabulary to fully express or to even to, now she clearly understood that my interest was so strongly connected to her past. So that was definitely something that, um, that I experienced as a third generation survivor. I love that. And I think that speaks to that connectivity and that meaning making in and of itself. And I must admit that's something I've looked into as well. Um, and after my, uh, my grandmother died in 2018, I looked into starting Yiddish classes as a way to feel more connected yes. and closer to her after her death. So I almost have a sense of jealousy that you got that you did that. And now it makes me wanna do it even more. I feel like after this webinar, I'm going to go look for Yiddish classes again to enroll. You know, it's interesting because Yiddish is experiencing a tremendous revival yeah. amongst people of third generation age and even younger than us. It's fascinating. Um, moving on to the next question, what broader impacts can intergenerational trauma have on a community or a society and how can the descendants of survivors preserve the legacy of the victims of the Holocaust without necessarily carrying forth the heavy emotional weight of previous generations? And is that even possible? It's an excellent question. And I want to speak to a little bit about this idea of emotional weight. And I would say sort of as a, as a society, we kind of label and judge what emotional weight looks like. And the reality is it's not necessarily a bad, and I don't like using dichotomous terms like bad and good, but emotional weight isn't necessarily a bad or a negative thing, right? And it's a normal part of the human experience. We have experiences that carry emotional weight. We have experiences that bring about distress, that bring about discomfort. And so oftentimes when we're labeling things, you know, as bad or emotional weight, you know, when, while things might carry emotional weight, they may also simultaneously uh, hold resilience and post-traumatic growth. So holding space for both of those things is oftentimes a good place to start, right? And as the descendant of a survivor, holding space for, you know, the atrocities that were committed and holding space for the traumas that were experiencing and experienced in the survival but also holding space for the resilience and the post-traumatic growth and holding space for both of those things 
can often be empowering and a useful place to start. So as we, as we talk about the, the broader impacts, uh, you know, and there has been research that has been done, not just in Holocaust families, but um, in other uh, cultural groups around collective cultural communal trauma. And most recently, there's been a lot of research and burgeoning research around, you know, re-traumatization um, that events and or racial stress and trauma or discrimination and the impact that those things can have on collective and cultural trauma. I, I wanna also speak to, um, you know, a little bit about what my research displayed. Uh, and I spoke a little bit about it earlier with this withdrawal and isolation symptom that, that was correlated with family communication and family functioning. But what the qualitative data actually backed up was this immense, this, this deep sense of differentness or interpersonal alienation amongst both second and third generation survivors. So feeling um, different as a direct result of the par their parents or grandparents um, experience. So that feeling of, of differentness, um, navigating the world as different was something that, that came up as significant in the project. But what also uh, emerged, and again, to hold that space with, you know, the emotional weight with resilience, there was also a deep feeling that they were resilient as a direct result, like you mentioned, as a direct result of their parents or grandparents' um, experience. And, you know, one of, one of the participants of the study mentioned that she refers to this as uh, Holocaust strength. And I, I really resonated with that term and even kind of integrated it into my own vocabulary, this sense of Holocaust strength. And in experiences of adversity, and this has been done actually with second generation and third generation survivors subsequent research as well around feeling Holocaust strength, maybe not directly using that term, but this sense of resilience, this sense of self-efficacy I can handle it because of my parent or grandparents' experience. Um, and so I think that's a really kind of important, uh, important piece of the puzzle. Um, yeah. Absolutely. That's such an interesting point about thinking of the converse of Holocaust trauma being Holocaust strength. And how can we empower ourselves in whatever life circumstances we may be facing at the moment with the backdrop of how incredibly strong our survivor grandparents had been in order to even survive and let alone thrive. Yeah. Um, turning now to your work specifically, um, in your work as a clinician, are there promising holistic treatment paths for intergenerational trauma? Or is the solution to treat behaviors and conditions that result from it individual? For instance, are there non-medical interventions that can help deal with intergenerational trauma, such as community-based solutions? So I think that's an important question. And with the recent addition uh, to our diagnostic manual uh, of the indirectly witnessing or indirectly experiencing a trauma is now included and has been since the most recent edition of our diagnostic manual as a part of post-traumatic stress disorder. So it used to be that if you would only be able to qualify for PTSD if you had di directly experienced the traumatic event. And so this change was pretty formative and important and critical in the subsequent research around this idea of intergenerational trauma. How do we treat it? What does it look like in the therapy room? What might we do with it? And so there are trauma-based interventions that could be useful in treating the components of trauma that might emerge from intergenerational trauma, the specific symptoms that might emerge out of that. They've also been doing a lot of research around family resilience, right? Resilient skills. How do we utilize those as, as an effective way to mitigate the effects of trauma and how trauma manifests within the family unit? Like some of the things we mentioned, communication, cohesiveness, problem solving, being able to regulate emotions within the family unit. So those are also ways 
that when once a family or an individual within a family experiences a traumatic event, that would be another great line of defense. And oftentimes in research, they include, you know, what might be a clinical, a really good, uh, you know, clinical implication of this study. Oh, we need more interventions that boost family resilience factors, right? And so there are already present uh, family resilience interventions, one particularly out of UCLA that I worked with for several years called FOCUS, Families Overcoming Under Stress, that is an intervention that is evidence-based for use with military and veteran families who have experiences, who experienced the challenges that come along with being within a military family. And so when we think about you know, interventions that one might use, thinking about family resiliency factors, boosting individual resiliency factors, and some of the more trauma-informed evidence-based uh, treatments that one might use to treat trauma more generally uh, would be a great place to start uh, in terms of you know, non-medical or more behavioral or cognitive interventions uh, for PTSD or trauma or intergenerational trauma uh, itself. Right. You know, that's, that's really, really important. And I'm wondering along those lines, if there is almost a subfield of psychology that deals directly with Holocaust trauma, and if there are support groups for second and third generation Holocaust survivors. Well, and I think that's an important question for meaning making, right? If that feels that, that connectivity, we talked a lot about the importance right connectivity, finding support, making meaning, narrative, storytelling, all of those things. I think that there definitely are, I hope there are uh, second and third generation support groups. I know that when I was conducting my dissertation, which was, which feels like yesterday and simultaneously decades ago at the same time, there were groups for second generation survivors. And my understanding is that there are third generation uh, survivor support groups um, as well available. Um, and now with, you know, everything being remote and online, they might even be more accessible now um, in these times, in our times of telehealth uh, than ever before. And, and so th those are more like formal support groups, but there are ways to initiate connection exactly. with survivors of genocide, uh, descendants of survivors of genocide and promote connectivity in communities through events like this, through webinars like this, where you know people can come together. I just recently did a talk at um, a, a Hillel as well to talk directly about third generation survivorship and being the third, gener the third generation survivor. And so ways like that um, are ways that we can create meaning and promote connectivity and connect with individuals who may have experienced similar things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wasserman. This has been so informative. At this time, we're going to open up the session to question and answer. So I'm going to have a look and then we will ask some questions. Okay, the first question from Elaine is, what role does attachment play in second and third generation? Such an excellent question. And we could, Elaine, we could talk about this for hours and hours just talking about attachment. And so they, ha they have done some research, again, with the parent-child dyadic relationship, mostly with first generation and second generation survivors. And a lot of that research surrounding attachment um, relates to Daniele's research around the conspiracy uh, of silence. Um, how, do, you know, how were survivors um, able to uh, support their children in meaningful ways if they continued to feel traumatized by their own experience? How were they able to make space for their children experience? And what we know about attachment, right? How that relates to, um, you know, that, that connection, being able, the child being able to turn to parent in times of need for emotional support. And so in thinking about the research that has already been done, there um, have definitely been shown to be some barriers to secure attachment in those relationships. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was impossible to develop secure attachments, right, between the first and second generation, but in thinking about some of the barriers, right, particularly as we think about the context of right after, and I can speak to my grandparents' experience, they, um, you know, were married and had my father uh, while they were still in a displaced persons camp in Germany. 
So again, to think about context, to think about environment, right? And then when my father was six months old, coming to um, you know America on the USS Wilson, I believe, and like you mentioned, Lisa, your grandparents' experience of building a life and all of those things, um, there were obvious ways that that resilience was transferred on and that secure attachment was, was able to be transferred. But I think it's an important question um, and is very context dependent as well and speaks to, you know, what was the first, how did the, the first generation, how did their symptoms manifest? How was, how did their coping manifest? And to even speak to that coping piece, uh, a lot of survivors after the war found these almost like survivor pods where they would get together and speak in Yiddish about their experiences during the war. And when my grandmother died going through her photos, she had hundreds of photos where she would come together with other survivors. And again, almost like storytelling, meaning making, finding avenues of support that seemed to be incredibly important and salient for a lot of survivors. I see Lisa, you nodding as well. I am because what you are talking, I share so much in common with what you are expressing. First of all, I would say, just on a personal note, my mother was also born in a displaced persons camp in Munich, Germany. And so, and then subsequently moved to the United States as a very young child but also talking to your point about almost finding uh, ways to connect with other survivors. You know, I grew up with visiting my grandmother at Roxbury Park. And at Roxbury Park, there was a group of the Yiddish Redendikis who would get together, who would share stories of the old country. They became their own support group mm -hmm. as the years went on and they shared milestones together building their own community of survivors. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and and as we again speak to this idea of meaning making, post-traumatic growth, resilience, um, social support and finding avenues of support and connectivity has often been researched as a very important resilience factor, right? Connectivity, finding support. And for many survivors, not all, but for many, that connectivity, that um, finding a group of people that understood you to your core and you were able to share stories and reminisce and connect uh, seemed to be something that was very important. Um, and so we can learn from that, right? What can we learn from that as second, as third generation, now as fourth generation, who knows, maybe fifth somewhere, but as we you know, think about subsequent generations learning from that and taking that um, as a mechanism of resilience and practicing it for meaning making. Absolutely. Um, moving on to our next question from Jennifer. How do you deal with families in which one generation has a stronger identification as a survivor than another generation? How do you deal with the conflict that this can create? Hmm. An excellent question. and. In speaking to that too, that's why I always like to ask, how salient does this feel to your identity? And knowing that there's not one, there's not one size fits all, there's not one right answer. So in connecting with that, that's a very important question to ask. How do I connect with? And maybe that's a question for family. How do you connect with, right, as a family member? How do you connect with? How salient does this feel? Um, as part of your identity. And to speak to the question around conflict, if there's a stronger maybe uh, connection um, between one family member and another, knowing that that's okay, right? There's not one right way, there's not a wrong way to sort of connect with parts of our identity. And so to use you know, some of those communication resilience factors to talk about that conflict to validate and understand that we all have differences. And if this is a difference in how we identify, right, there's not one right or wrong way to connect with parts of our identity, including this part of our identity at, as well. And I imagine you're not alone in that. There, there are likely descendants out there or family members out there that might not find that to be a very salient part of their identity. 
or maybe in some instances, it might feel more salient than other instances. And knowing that, that that's okay, there's not one right or wrong way to connect with parts of our identity. The next question from Shafira is, Dr. Wasserman, do you see patients? I do. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that question. I do. I'm, I'm, I have my private practice here located in Tarzana, and I do, I do work with patients uh, primarily who have experienced PTSD, trauma, intergenerational trauma, um, other types of traumas, and that's the, the bulk of my private practice here in Tarzana. It's great to know. I'm going to make a note of that. <laughs> Next question from Mark. What for you are the most accurate and illuminating films or books which explore the psychology of post-war Holocaust survival and intergenerational trauma? Oh, such a, such a good question. I wish I was home. I would take out all of my books for you, Mark, and just send them all to you. Um, and we're actually in the process of moving now. So they're already all boxed up. Maybe I'll just send them your way. <laughs> Um, I, I think there's a, a variety of different books. Uh, one particularly uh, by Leon Uris, which is QB7, which is an emotional roller coaster. So oftentimes too, I wanna be, I'm gonna put my psychologist hat on for like a quick second when we read, when we watch films um, that connect with uh, this experience, being mindful of taking care of ourselves, monitoring how traumatized or re-traumatized we might feel when reading these books, when watching these movies, um, pausing as necessary, reflecting as necessary, asking for support as necessary um, is an important point. Uh, I would probably say that, that QB7 by Leon Uris is one of uh, uh, the books that uh, I have read that I recommend. Um, uh, another one uh, that again, uh, it captures the experience in a quite an intense way. Uh, this Way to the Gas, ladies and gentlemen, is another one um, that I have uh, I have read and again is intense and emotional, but uh, another one, oh my goodness, uh, there's, there's so many. Uh, I would like to simmer on that question mark. It's, it's, it's stumped me a bit in terms of going through my Rolodex of films uh, and books, but I'll maybe ask you, Lisa, are there ones, are there books, are there films, or maybe even those from the audience that you might recommend? Um, I definitely agree with you in that Leon Uris has a tremendous power in conveying emotion of Holocaust trauma. And that is a book that I have on my bookshelf as well. Yeah. Even as you share like Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, I mean, I think as a month, I think it should be a must read for absolutely everyone in the universe. Um, you know, Ellie Wiesel's Night, those are all ones. Uh, Victor Frankel is one that I've oftentimes recommended for patients, for students. Uh, that's, a, that's one that, that I think would be um, an important one. There's also one, uh, a more recent one called The Choice by Dr. Edith Eager. Um, yeah. Edgar, I might have totally mispronounced her name there for a moment, uh, that I would highly recommend. And she is a psychologist, Holocaust survivor, activist. Um, I would highly recommend checking out all of her books, uh, but The Choice is a more recent one uh, that she's come out with that is uh, beautifully written and captures the experience in a powerful way. And I would also, to that note, I would add the book Number the Stars, which is a children's book. It's geared for, I would say, middle school age children as a, as a way of an introduction to the history of the Holocaust. The next question is from Mia. As a younger viewer, I know so many who do not even know about the Holocaust. How important do you believe it is to teach this in schools? I may have a biased perspective, but I think that it's incredibly important uh, to teach this and other genocides in schools. And um, I, I think that it's, it's so incredibly uh, important. And I know that there has been a lot of activism and lobbying around how do we uh, teach this in schools, um, you know, at what age, when, for how long, what books, 
uh, do we utilize or what teaching methodology methodologies do we want to utilize to uh, to teach this in schools, but I think it's incredibly uh, important. The project that Lisa and I engaged in and talked a little bit about, if you heard what I heard, um, is also like an educational project as well around hearing Holocaust stories and recounts from the most recent generation, so from third generation survivors. And so that's a, a, another powerful way to communicate uh, stories um, and narrative in a way, uh, and the intent of that was for it to be powerful. You know, the, even the title of the project, if you heard what I heard, you would never forget. So um, another way to utilize videos or um, you know, documentary recounts to uh, share and educate about the Holocaust. Right, and to that point, I would also add that there's a direct correlation between education and understanding of other communities, right? Who we may not be a part of, or we may not know members of personally. And when we understand other communities, we have the tools to combat hate. So education is indeed a fundamental tool for our society. Uh, next question from Linda. If Holocaust trauma was experienced as a child, mother was saved by being put on the kinder transport at age nine and never saw her parents again, is there a difference in manifestation of trauma in descendants versus Holocaust experienced by a more mature person? That is an excellent question, Linda. And the research in some ways, and, and my study didn't, but, but in many ways, oftentimes this idea of Holocaust trauma is sort of uh, clumped uh, in terms of not identifying the different ways in which a person may have survived. And so I think that's an important variable that needs additional research on uh, particularly what are the different ways, the particular Holocaust experience. And we know that there's an incredible amount of diversity in terms of uh, the survivor's experience. Exactly like you mentioned, kinder transport, hiding, partisan, concentration camp, work camp. That's not even naming all of them, but there's an incredible amount of diversity in that experience. And I'm not sure that the research currently grasps that level of diversity of experience, but uh, is something that I think needs a little bit uh, more research at this time. So oftentimes in research, when we're talking about um, Holocaust survivor, we are including all of those experiences. And so we might be missing some of those more nuanced um, experiences of the survivor, but an, an, excellent, uh, an excellent question and one that I think needs a little bit more uh, research on. Definitely. I think we have time for a couple more questions. So I'm going to move now to a question by Mark. Can you speak to the amount of anxiety and stress that, that us pass from survivors to their offspring and from second generation to their offspring? And to what extent does this anxiety stress affect functioning in the world emotionally and mentally? So Particularly, they, studies have shown, and in my particular study, we looked more specifically at the relationship between family communication and psychological symptoms. But there has been uh, research that has been done in second generation survivors around fear, mistrust uh, of others, and anxiety uh, being elevated or higher in descendants of survivors as compared to a control group. And so that anxiety and or mistrust or stress can manifest in different ways and look differently for different individuals. And so in terms of how that anxiety and mistrust can even pass on to future generations, you know, I, I think that's definitely, you know, into speaking about even in my research, how that showed both in second, third generation and second generation survivors, that can be something that can be passed on. Now, symptoms, as we even talk about them more broadly, there's been a lot of research more generally done around parental mental health and how that impacts a, a child's social and emotional um, adjustment or development. And so there have, there's been a lot of research around how that can even be transgenerational 
separate from you know what we're talking about in terms of intergenerational trauma or Holocaust trauma um, or things like that. So to what to what extent? I think it depends and looks different dependent on you know severity of symptoms. Dependent on are there other uh, caregivers or avenues of support for the child? Um, how are those? How is that anxiety and stress communicated within the family context? So I think it can really depend on all of those other variables, including some of the environmental area uh, variables that we discussed before, in terms of how that um, is displayed or how that shows transmission of maybe anxiety or how that shows intergenerational transmission of stress um, as well. So I, I think, and I know I'm not wild about this answer, it depends on context, it depends on familial context, it depends on family communication, cohesion, sort of all of those variables that are shown to play an important part in any sense of intergenerational transmission of stress, anxiety, trauma, anything. Right, and for our last question, I would just build on that concept of familial expression. How do I introduce, uh, this is from Ev, how do I introduce transgenerational concepts of trauma to my parents? I think that in in speaking about you know how that would also depend on on context as well and um, how things are communicated overall within that relationship, but ways of opening that dialogue, um, you know, and and talking about you know maybe even using this webinar as a point of reference. You know, hey, I attended this webinar the other day, and I would love to get your thoughts on this idea. What do you think? oftentimes a great way to lead with that, gathering a sense of what they think about these concepts, what others think about these constructs in a more inquisitive and curious way. And oftentimes when we come at something with curiosity, uh, it, it's, it can be a really useful place to come from, right? You know, I'm really wondering, what is your experience of this? Do you feel like this rings true? Does this feel salient? Can often be a good starting point in jumping into to conversations like this. Um, maybe if there is a fear of how is this individual going to take this? Um, you know, I, I don't want to come at this in a way that would lead them to be defensive or feel uh, maybe uh, sadness or guilt in some way. So coming at it from a place of curiosity and inquisitiveness, right? How do you connect? I'm wondering if this feels salient or true for you. Can oftentimes be a good place to open up that line um, of dialogue with parents or others uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wasserman. I've gained so much insight and wisdom as a third generation survivor. And I thank you for providing all of us with your expertise on this subject. Uh, I'm going to now turn it back to uh, Harmony from the Holocaust Museum Los Angeles for some concluding remarks. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Holocaust Museum LA and Harmony for having me today. Well, thank you both uh, so much on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA. We really wanna thank you, uh, Dr. Wasserman and, and Lisa for sharing your time and your expertise with us today and your experiences. Uh, before we sign off, I want to invite everyone to join us on Thursday, May 13th at 11 a.m. for a special program featuring Holocaust survivor Gabriella Karen, uh, who survived by hiding in an Ursuline monastery in Bratislava. Uh, you can also join us next week on May 18th at 5 p.m. for How We Got Here, From the Good War to the Storming of the Capitol, a conversation with Stephen J. Roth and former Congressperson Mel Levine about the historical roots of the Capitol siege in post-war white supremacy. This program will be presented in partnership with Lisa's own Kasdan Institute. Uh, you can also find more information about all our virtual events on our website at holocaustmuseumla.org. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's at no charge. If if you are enjoying our, our programs, please consider supporting our work by going to holocaustmuseumla.org to make a donation. Uh, we want to thank you again, uh, say thank you again to Dr. Melissa Wasserman and Lisa Ansel and to all of you for joining us today. Uh, take care, stay well, and we hope to see you all again in person someday soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye.